Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, can you hear me okay? My name is Nate Stetson. I'm a general neurosurgeon in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, uh, in private practice. And um, I, um, I'm going to give a talk today on tether cord syndrome. But uh, I've actually uh, I've, I've chosen to get a little bit more involved in ASAP. And uh, for a couple of reasons, I, I have a, a growing private practice with a lot of uh, a fair number of Chiari patients in the practice. And uh, I also have a little bit of a unique uh, perspective. I trained at a place called the, the Chiari Institute, um, uh, North Shore LIJ Health Systems, and so. Through the training, I sort of uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to really learn a lot more than most about this entity. So, uh, with those two reasons, I, I've sort of taken a little bit of an interest uh, in Chiari and associated conditions. Um, and you know, just want to make one side note: uh, what Dr. Kula was saying, there's a, there's a lot of relevance to this. Um, it's amazing when you get out in, in the general neurosurgery community and you see uh, how little, what little is known about, about Chiari among neurologists, uh, neurosurgeons, and the general sort of medical community. It's, it's, it's quite striking. So, um, you know, it's, it's a significant factor in the care for Chiari. And so I think, obviously, uh, these kinds of uh, forums are great for getting the word out. And also, uh, we, we need to do the work of including more physicians in this. But anyway, um, so today I'm going to talk about tethered cord syndrome. Uh, tethered cord is a, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, phenomenon. Um, uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the background, uh, some of the normal anatomy and also the abnormal anatomy associated with tethered cord. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the diagnosis and, uh, and management, uh, some of the imaging, and then we'll go through some, uh, some operative photographs and uh, take a look at what it means to actually detether a cord. And then we'll touch on a couple of uh, brief um, topics that are a little controversial um, with, this, with respect to this uh, area. Uh, tether cord is a concept that's been around for quite, quite a period of time. It's been around for about 150 years. Uh, first in 1857, a guy named Johnson described a fatty tumor of the spinal cord that was tightly connected to the spinal membranes. Um, in 1910, Fuchs wrote about uh, patients with something called a myelomeningocele, which we'll explain later, um, and noted incontinence when patients uh, bent forward, and he suggested this was due to tension on the spinal cord. So this idea was really present early on um, in the early 1900s. Uh, the term phylum terminal syndrome was coined in 53 by Garceau. He reported on, I think, three patients with, uh, that had tethered cord uh, surgeries, and they actually got better. Um, in 76, Hoffman and colleagues suggested the term tethered spinal cord uh, for patients with a low-lying conus uh, and a thickened phylum in a paper looking at some patients with, uh, that had improved uh, after the cutting of the phylum. So it's, it's, the, the concept has been around for a long period of time, but it's still... Uh, uh, a, lot, a, little, a lot is unknown, and it's a very controversial. Um, so what is it? Um, tether cord is really uh, it's a, it's a syndrome that patients have where they have progressive neurological, uh, urological, and orthopedic issues uh, related to a tethering effect of the actual spinal cord um, by the terminal phylum. We'll go over some of the anatomy. Uh, it's, it's long been recognized as a disorder in kids, so pediatric neurosurgeons have been treating this for a long period of time, but it's becoming more recognized in the adult population. Um, it's, uh, it's, it can be seen in association with a whole host of uh, congenital abnormalities, so abnormalities from birth. Um, it's technically considered a, a spinal dysraphism. So uh, spinal dysraphism is a term that refers to some sort of abnormal development um, occurring in the midline of the back from the level of the skin to the actual vertebra. And usually it involves an area of the lumbosacral spine and uh, can either be in an open or closed fashion, and we'll talk about that. Um, in terms of incidence and risk factors, uh, what we know is, is really, really very little, to be honest with you. Um, the, incident, the true incidence of tether cord is, is not known, but it's becoming more evident because I think we've got better imaging. Uh, there's a little bit more of an awareness of the entity out there, so people are looking for it. A lot of problem with, with this is that there are subtle findings on, on radiographs and images, and so uh, clinicians don't always know to look for it and can, can miss it very easily. Um, in the pediatric literature, there, it's thought that it's, there's a higher incidence when associated with myelomeningocele,s uh, anywhere from 2.8 to 32 percent, but that's a rough estimate. Um, there's limited data on the risk factors for this, so what puts you at risk? Well, the only things that we, we think we know are um, maybe a first-degree relative, if you have a first-degree relative um, that has a known neural tube defect, or if you're a patient that had a, a folate deficiency during gestation, those are some risk factors, but those are risk factors for general spinal uh, dysmorphisms. 
Um, so in order to understand the, the entity, you have to sort of under, you have to understand the, the actual uh, normal anatomy first. Uh, the end of the spinal cord is called the conus medullaris, the medullary cone in Latin. So it's a it's a cone at the end of this. The spinal cord tapers off into a cone, and it is anchored to the tailbone by something called the phylum. It's a thin uh, fibrous structure. Um, you can see the phylum, this is the conus here, and then you've got the, the phylum here, and there's actually two components to the phylum. There's what's called an intradural uh, component, which is inside the uh, dural membrane. The dural is a, dural is a sac that surrounds the, uh, the spinal cord. And then you have the extradural component, uh, which is down here, and the dura sort of forms this part of the, uh, of the phylum. So this is, a, again, a cartoon showing um, the anatomy we talked about. You have the conus, the end of the spinal cord, all the nerve roots coming off, and then the phylum coming down. And this is actually a real a cadaver specimen um, showing just the, what it looks like is the, the tip of the, of the spinal cord, and then you have all the nerve roots coming down, and you have the A is actually the, uh, the phylum. So it's just a thin band in the middle of all these nerve roots. Um, in 1944, uh, Raymond and, Ar and uh, Arson uh, did a study um, uh, where they looked at, uh, they took a bunch of cadavers, and they actually, they want, the question was, where does the spinal cord end in the normal human being? And they found, after looking at all these cadavers, that, that the normal level was somewhere around L1-2. Now, there's some variation uh, in their study, but, but it's commonly accepted that the normal level is, is around L1-2. And so when the conus is well below that, it indicates uh, usually that there's significant pathology. Um, also, in order to understand this disease entity, entity um, you have to know a little bit about the normal development. Um, this is sort of a busy slide, but on the right-hand side, this is just a, a fancy photomicrograph, electron micrograph, of uh, a process called neurulation. So the, between uh, 18 to 28 days uh, af after gestation, after a sperm uh, enters a, an egg, uh, the neural tube forms, and it, this is the premature early spinal cord. At the end of that premature early spinal cord, there are groups of cells that formulate, and the names aren't that imp important, but uh, one is the ventriculus terminalis and one is the caudal cell mass. This group of cells uh, formulates itself to produce the conus, which is the end of the spinal cord, all of the nerve roots that come off the spinal cord, and the actual phylum. Um, the interesting thing is, during gestation, so as the embryo grows, uh, the spinal column actually grows faster than the spinal cord itself, and so, um, you have a phenomenon where, where the spinal cord, uh, excuse me, the spinal column grows ex exceedingly fast and actually pulls the spinal cord up as it grows. And so it stretches out the, uh, what's called the phylum terminale and as well as the uh, nerve roots. Um, and that, that is part of the normal progression of, uh, of gestation. Now with tethered cord syndrome, uh, it's thought that there's, this process sort of goes awry, that there's some problem with this process. Um, as the spinal cord and vertebral column develop uh, in an unsynchronized fashion, this is presumably uh, one of the reasons why tethered cord can happen. That's one thought. Um, tethering of the cord can be either from a very thin um, uh, cord or a very thick, uh, fatty, infiltrated phylum. Uh, we see both. And both can lead to uh, a tension on the cord and nerve dysfunction. Um, generally, uh, tethered cord is associated, so on, on, a, on an MRI, you'll see a low-lying conus, a conus below L2-3. However, uh, there is a li literature to support the fact that uh, people can have a tethered cord, uh, but that it's at a normal position at L2-3. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the conversation, or end of, end of the talk. Um, Tethered cord is oftentimes uh, associated with various congenital anomalies. Um, you can have uh, spinal defects, either open or closed defects. Um, you can have vertebral or orthopedic issues, club foot, scoliosis, et cetera. Um, people often have uh, anorectal anomalies, uh, even uh, human tails, um, and other uh, entities. Uh, patients with tether cord syndrome usually have a structural lesion uh, that tethers the cord to the spinal column. Um, a tumor can tether the cord, uh, something called a myelomeningocele, and there's actually a picture. Um, this is a myelomeningocele here, and it's a, essentially where nerves and meninges are exposed to the outside world through a defect uh, in the spinal, uh, spinal column. Um, this is actually a picture of a myelomeningocele, which is essentially a fatty tumor beneath the skin um, that um, actually communicates through the spinal column and, uh, and essentially attaches to the nerve roots and uh, is associated with a long uh, tethered cord. 
uh, fibrous tissue uh, can tether the cord, uh, something called arachnoid adhesions. Um, and uh, people that have had prior uh, surgeries early on can actually retether their cord just from scar tissue from the actual surgery. That's pretty common as well. So uh, identifying tether cord, it's, it's, it can be a challenge to identify. Uh, generally speaking, um, uh, and the pediatric neurosurgeons may uh, uh, find this a little controversial, but it, it usually is a little uh, easier to identify in pediatric patients because there are associated uh, abnormalities, skin abnormalities, um, these musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal abnormalities, et cetera. In the adult population, uh, it's generally accepted, or generally thought that the um, Symptoms are a little more uh, mild, and they also can die, they can mimic uh, symptoms in other diseases, especially degenerative diseases of the spine. And so it's a little more challenging to pick up these these uh, things in adult patients. A lot of times, these adult patients that go in to be seen are dismissed as having something else because either cl clinicians can't make sense of the exam that they see. Um, again, on the imaging, the, su the findings are usually very subtle, and most radiologists won't even read out uh, a low-lying conus, even if it's there. Uh, so it's not something that everyone's trained to look at. Um, and again, on the examinations, there can be a vast array of different findings on exam, but it's interesting because a lot of the deficits you see on an exam don't make sense to most clinicians and don't make sense to most of the neurosurgeons that, that, uh, that see this. And so um, it, it can be a little confusing for that reason. A lot of people want to chalk a lot of these findings up to degenerative diseases and other things, but that's uh, not always the case. Um, in terms of symptomatology, um, it's not clear whether adult and pediatric tether cord uh, share the same underlying disease process. Uh, there's different camps of thought. Uh, some folks think that it's uh, on the same spectrum, just with a varying degree of, of severity and uh, varying degrees of, of uh, findings. Um, some people think that adult patients really are more just uh, uh, patients that have sort of a more occult or hidden tethered cord that just wasn't discovered at a younger age. Um, in terms of symptomatology, what we, what we do know is that uh, in the adult patients, the pain is usually a more of the, one of the more pre predominant findings, and uh, followed by urological dysfunction and sensory and motor problems. In pediatric patients, um, typically there are many other uh, findings. There's cutaneous find skin findings like hairy patches, uh, dimples, um, tracks that discharge. Um, you can have human tails, et cetera. Uh, there's a lot of scoliotic deformities, so patients with, uh, with uh, degenerative, uh, excuse me, the scoliosis of the spine, uh, club foot, other orthopedic issues. And then um, in terms of urological issues, a lot of kids will present with frequent urinary tract infections. Uh, they'll present uh, with what's called neurogenic bladder or frequency. Um, and so that, uh, that's, that's more common. And kids can't always tell you that they're having pain. Kids can't always vocalize the discomfort they're having. So uh, a lot of these other things usually alert a physician to obtain imaging and then move forward with everything. Um, the neurological examination can be, uh, uh, we're not going to get into that, but it can be actually very uh, quite mixed. Um, both they can see both upper and motor, neural, uh, motor neuron signs. And so that, that's another talk. But uh, it can be a challenge to clinicians. So that, that makes it even more challenging. So uh, symptom onset, uh, when the symptoms occur, uh, can be affected by multiple things. In adults, as they age, um, fibrosis of the phylum or thickening of the phylum uh, can make it more inelastic. And so the cord tethers and there's more symptoms from that. Um, developing spinal stenosis or common arthritis can aggravate underlying tethered cord. In kids, if they have sudden growth spurts or an increase in physical activity or trauma, that can also aggravate an underlying disease uh, that they have. Now, in, in a lot of folks present with urodynamic issues, um, and like Dr. Kula was talking about, you know, they, you know, it may be normal for some of these kids or adults to urinate frequently throughout the day. Um, sphincter dysfunction is, is very common. So you can get uh, frank incontinence where they lose control of your urination. Uh, they get urgency where they feel like they have to go to the bathroom a lot, and they do go to the bathroom frequently. Um, patients often get recurrent urinary tract infections. Um, formal urodynamic testing by urologist really uh, is, plays a key role in a number of different areas. Uh, it's really good for diagnosing, so establishing that there is a problem with urination. It's also good uh, because if you're following a patient uh, conservatively, you can follow the urodynamic uh, testing uh, to see if they get worse, uh, et cetera. And with surgery, you can actually show uh, improvement in urodynamic functioning after surgical uh, intervention. 
So what, what causes all the symptoms of tethered cord? I mean, what is it about the traction on the cord that causes symptoms? Um, a lot of, most people think that, that um, repeated mechanical shocks and uh, strong fixation of the cord uh, causes this nerve dysfunction, but there's been some uh, interesting work over the past couple of decades. There's been some basic science research uh, on animals uh, showing that there's actually uh, diminished uh, blood flow and even uh, what's called decreased metabolism, uh, the ability of the cells to use energy. Um, and it's been shown that in, after uh, uh, cutting uh, the phylum, uh, these things can actually improve. And there was a study uh, in pediatric patients, um, actually one of my attendings from residency uh, helped publish the paper on, uh, on a series of uh, kids that had the tethered cord cut, and uh, they showed that there was improved uh, blood flow, actually, uh, to, the, to the cord after, after that. Um, Again, adult symptomatology is thought to worsen um, uh, with time, uh, with various conditions, degenerative conditions, um, trauma to the tethered spinal cord, um, and repetitive motions that, that actually um, put stress on the tethered cord. Uh, prolonged sitting, bending forward, uh, for forced flexion of the hips, uh, et cetera. Um, there's some different types of adult tethered cord, um, which we, we won't go through. In, uh, uh, on physical examination, um, you often see uh, sensory abnormalities, so uh, patients have difficulty uh, with sensation. Um, they get weakness in a, in, in a part of their body. Uh, bowel and bladder incontinence is very common. Uh, you can see trophic ulcers, which are ulcers that develop over um, uh, areas of skin that, that are over bony prominences. And so they're, because of a lack of uh, innervation to the skin or, or abnormal innervation, they can't necessarily feel things the way other people do. And so they, it wears, down, uh, wears the skin down. And this, it's similar to a, a diabetic uh, ulcer. Uh, patients uh, can be seen to have leg muscle uh, atrophy or shrinking, um, scoliosis, uh, and you can see a whole host of uh, skin markings, uh, hairy patches, um, uh, stains, um, other things, discharging sinuses, etc. On the imaging, um, you know, we use a whole host of imaging, but really uh, it boils down to so plain x-rays um, are only really good for seeing uh, scoliosis and uh, gross bony defects. Uh, ultrasound can be used in, in young kids and, and neonates and young infants for screening uh, for various abnormalities. Uh, CT scan is used to look at the bony defects. So if there's a bony spine defect, you can see it with a CAT scan. Uh, MRI is the gold standard for really looking at all of this stuff. Um, MRI will show you uh, low-lying conus, uh, thickened phylum. Uh, it will show you a, a lesion that may be tethering the, uh, the cord uh, down to the spinal column. And so that's really the, uh, the best study to use. Um, we're not going to get into this too much, but I thought I'd just show a few uh, 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 MRIs. Um, this is one of an eight-year-old boy uh, that has a fatty phylum, and you can see here this arrow indicates the fatty phylum, and then he has a low-lying conus um, as well, as you, you can see here. And uh, on a T2-weighted image, you can also see he has a neuro, something called a neuroenteric cyst and even has uh, syringomalia. And um, the, uh, this is just an interesting example of, of that. Um, this is uh, uh, MRIs for three separate adult patients, uh, just showing that, um, that there is a low-lying low -lying conus in each of them. Um, if you look at the rest of the MRIs, you can see that there is, there is some various degrees of bone abnormalities associated with it. So generally speaking, you see some sort of abnormality with a low-lying conus. Uh, now, in terms of surgical intervention, um, the timing of neurosurgical intervention with adult tethered cord syndrome is, is a little bit of controversial. Um, the debate sort of parallels how uncertain the course of natural history is. We don't know what the long-term effects in natural history are, so uh, it's a little uh, controversial. Um, the diagnosis of tethered cord syndrome um, and the decision to operate is really usually based on uh, multiple things. Uh, one is from your clinical examination, another is from the actual imaging that you uh, obtain, um, and as well as urine dynamic studies and even EMGs, et cetera. Um, Decision-making in symptomatic patients is always very easier. Um, if they're symptomatic and they're getting worse neurologically, obviously it makes sense to operate. In asymptomatic patients, uh, it's a little more debatable. There are some surgeons that will actually operate uh, prophylactically, uh, meaning that they'll operate even if the patients aren't getting worse because they think that the natural history is that, that most people will actually get worse. I think what most surgeons do is follow people clinically, and, and once they see signs of deterioration, then they'll, they'll end up operating. 
Um, in terms of operative findings, usually what you see during the operation is what you'll see on a preoperative MRI. So you'll see some sort of abnormality on the MRI, either soft tissue or bony. Um, there are plenty of instances where you actually operate and find things you wouldn't see on the MRI, uh, arachnoid adhesions, scar tissue, et cetera. Uh, but generally, there's a, whole, there's a whole list of abnormalities that you can see uh, when you do the operations. Um, so here's a, I'm going to show you some examples of intraoperative photographs. Uh, this is kind of a classic photograph that has been in some textbooks uh, that I thought I'd show because it's, uh, this is a low-lying conus and there's a fatty phylum. Um, this is actually the phylum in an intraoperative image showing sort of a thickened uh, fatty phylum. Um, that's what it looks like uh, amidst, all the rest, amidst all the rest of the nerve roots. Um, I'm going to show you some intraoperative photographs and show you this, so the, step, the basic step of an operation. Um, this is a, a younger patient, um, and what you're looking at is the, uh, we've, we've done a laminectomy, taken off a, a piece of bone, and what you're looking at is the dura. So this is the sac that the spinal cord actually sits in. It's a sac of fluid that the spinal cord floats in. Uh, the first step is to make what's called a durotomy. You make an incision in the dura and open up the dura so that you can go in and find the, uh, the phylum. Uh, second step is to actually find the phylum and, and separate it from all the surrounding nerve roots that are within the dural sac. Uh, usually uh, most surgeons nowadays uh, will separate the phylum using a little rubber band or something and, uh, and we typically use electrophysiological monitoring to test and make sure that there's no nerve roots actually in with the phylum. It would be obviously uh, awful to uh, cut a nerve root uh, in that area. Um, so once we've stimulated and we're sure that it's the actual phylum, then we can section it. Uh, this is a, just a series of pictures showing the steps. Typically, uh, surgeons either coagulate or they will uh, tie off the, uh, the phylum. And that's shown here. And then you'll, for this, in this picture, we actually cut the, uh, the phylum. You can actually see a couple of little nerve roots poking out through the dura. Um, here is the phylum that's been sectioned and a piece has been taken out. And then eventually we, we put the phylum back in the, uh, the dura. And then there's the closure process, which includes, uh, it includes uh, closing with uh, various types of suture. That's really surgeon preference. And, uh, and then I almost always use a fat graft to, um, to actually cover the, uh, the abnormality and help it heal. Um, so, okay, the, one of the controversial areas in, in uh, Curare right now, and, and, and something that I get, I actually have gotten asked a lot about, I'm sure uh, many of the other surgeons have gotten asked about, is this idea of occult tethered cord syndrome. Um, there have been some descriptions of tethered cord in both adult and kids. Um, it's still very controversial, and, and if you ask 100 surgeons, you'll probably you know, get various opinions. Um, most of the patients that have a normal conus on the MRI usually have some sort of associated uh, abnormality um, that you, if you look hard enough, you can see whether it's on examination or the MRI. There's usually some sort of abnormality that goes along with a, a supposed tethered cord with the conus at the normal position. Um, in this population of patients, uh, symptoms of pain and, and bowel and bladder incontinence appear to be responsive to, de to detethering. Uh, but again, it's a very uh, rare entity. Um, Occult tethered cord syndrome is highly controversial, and so obviously um, surgical intervention uh, varies uh, between surgeons. And um, that's it. So, references? <laughs> there you go. <laughs>